and some of our remote viewers have concluded that yes, it's going to happen this time. That we and it will be on the same side of the sun at the same time. And if the remote viewer, and they're getting their information from ETs, from sources within the US, U.S. government that tell me that yes, they are deeply concerned about it and they're worried sick about it and they don't know what to do about it. What, what could the government or anyone else tell you? What could they say to you? Would, would they tell you that, grab your hat, dig a hole, hang on? He says, oh, it seems to be a rather nice planet and we know about it and it, all we need to do is name it and then bless his heart, you know, he, he had never had a heart problem but within a year he was dead with a heart attack. Incredible race of humans does have a future and it is in the stars mm -hmm. and we are going out there to reclaim our rightful place. It's kind of amusing considering that the last time we met I told you it was to be my last interview and here I am again and you know, how can I explain that? We have gotten the most incredible response to your interview. I, I have to say, it's, it's actually been the most popular of all of our interviews. Well, and nice I think there's a reason for that. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think that in many ways, you, you put yourself on the line and you, you actually embody the curiosity that was like, rampant in all of us and you did it at a time when um, and in the military no less and you broke rules and you you kind of stuck it out and you're just you're like you're just uh, I don't know a one-man disclosure project as far as I'm concerned well thank you Carrie that's very kind of you to say that but let me explain something I was a normal human being for a big chariot big portion of my life you know, I was a career military and uh, no-nonsense kind. I wore a crew cut. When I learned what I learned in 1963, 64, 65, it, it changed my life. It changed my way of thinking, and I became obsessed with what I had learned. And over the years, I've learned so much more. And as I may have mentioned to you earlier, I, I learned a little bit. I wanted more. You know, talk about an addiction. When you start learning some things about a subject that is so profound, the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And the more I wanted to know, the more I learned. And the more I learned, the more obsessed I became. And uh, you talk about losing a paradigm. My old paradigm literally crumbled around my knees. You know, the world that I thought I lived in, is I learned, was not the world that I lived in. And the reality that I looked around and thought I saw was not the reality that exists. Mm -hmm. That much of what we see is an illusion. It, it's, it's a result of our own illusions. We, <clears throat> we humans sometimes, rather, rather than face reality, we create a little, little world of our own. You know, we get up and go to work. We, raise the kids, we buy a house, buy a car, take a vacation, go on about our lives, try to save money, put a little in the bank for the kids' college, and, and, and live a normal life. And then I learned that, that there's no such thing as a normal life, that the world that exists is not at all what we think it is. And the more I learned, as I said, uh, my, my old paradigm crashed around my knees and uh, I'm sitting here in front of you uh, as, a, as a human wreck, you might say, you know, as to what I used to be. Because I lived in a world that was kind of cut and dried. Oh, you know, do this, do that, you pay your bills. You, it's not that way at all. Well... Let's cut to the chase here because you have come forward. Actually, you contacted us, I'm going to say, and said, you've got something new to say. You've got something new to tell the people. And I, I know you're going to be speaking at the Bay Area uh, mm -hmm. Conference, and, and this is amazing. And 
let's let's find out what is it that that's new. What is it you're willing to? You you want me to divulge to you my great revelations, which I'm planning to speak about at my at the conference. Right? Absolutely. And <laughs> and you know this this video will not be edited and out there before the conference, so you don't have to worry that we're not gonna gonna ruin it for the for the viewers of the well, conference. Well, there's lots of little tidbits that are kind of interesting to me. Uh, I, I assume, I hope they'll be interesting to the people at San Jose. Uh, it's been my experience that the people who attend those conferences are pretty wide open, open-minded. Mm -hmm. As I jokingly used to say when I speak there, it's like preaching to the choir, you know, mm -hmm. because they're a different group of people. <clears throat> well, give me a, I'll give you a tiny tidbit, which I found interesting. As you perhaps have understood, I have been a member of what we used to jokingly call the Old Boys Network. I've been a member of it for over 40 years. And when we created this group, it was made up of military types primarily, uh, all ranks, all services. And we even had a couple of cosmonauts who were connected with this, mm -hmm. who were providing information. Well, over the years, the Old Boys have shared information with each other because we've had a variety of, of assignments and jobs in the military. We had a couple of admirals, we had a general, we had two cosmonauts, we have innumerable colonels and command sergeant majors and people from all walks everywhere who provided information we used to share with each other. And some of us have been in very sensitive positions and had access to very highly classified material and we've been very open about sharing that with others, <clears throat> which kind of kept us going for a long, long time. There aren't a hell of a lot of us left. The last time I, re uh, originally there was a m roughly about uh, 150 members of this group. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and today uh, there's probably not more than a dozen left. Uh, we, we lost a good one, you know, Graham Bethune died here about a year ago. And Graham was a retired Navy commander who was a dear man, mm -hmm. who had some very sensitive information he used to share with others. But as I point out, we shared among ourselves. And then a few of us who came out blatantly, purposely, and started sharing what we had learned with the public. Frankly, I never thought I was going to get away with it. I thought they were going to stamp on me and, you know, eliminate me or whatever. There was even rumors, for God's sake, that they were going to call me back to active duty and court-martial me. <laughs> you know, well, I'm going to be 80 at my next birthday, so I don't think they want to call me back to active duty. You know, I could have an accident, but I think why I'm getting away with what I'm getting away with, so to speak, where I'm releasing bits and pieces of this, this cover-up is that there's somebody back there somewhere who wants me to do what I'm doing. Or I would not have been able to do this. But let me give you a tiny tidbit of bits and pieces that come from the Old Boys Network. There is an organization called the National Reconnaissance Office. You've probably heard of them. Absolutely. A very super secret group. I mean, a super secret group among super secret groups. God, we've got so damn many groups now. As I used to jokingly say, when poor old Ike left office, he tried to tell us about the uh, military-industrial complex. Well, it's a triad now. It's not just the military and industry. Mm -hmm. It's the national security agencies as well. Mm -hmm. So the, if he could see it today, he'd be shocked even more. Of course, I'm sure he's alive and well somewhere, so he's probably looking down chuckling. But we are a triad now. The super secret agencies with the military and the industry. It's all like this. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, <clears throat> there are people who I think want this out. We've, been, we've known for years that among the in crowd, whoever the hell they are, and no one really has ever been able to put our finger on it, we've been able to grab a couple of them from the old Magi group the wise men they called themselves, the Magi. You've heard them referred to as a Majestic Twelve. Well, they are a lot more than twelve now. <clears throat> in 
Anyhow, I'm getting away with sharing bits and pieces and tidbits which intrigue me because I think somebody wants some of this out. But the story I was going to share with you is that uh, in the National Reconnaissance Office about, I guess, four or five years now, they had for a number of years a, a series of satellites called the Keyhole System. Have you heard of it? Uh, yes. Keyhole. Oh, it was super secret and probably the very best satellite system in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, they probably made it even better now. They could supposedly read a postage stamp from space. Well, <clears throat> there were some intriguing questions being raised by a number of people about what was known as the Ararat Anomaly. Are you familiar with the Ararat Anomaly? Mount Ararat, Nozog. Okay. And so the, the guys in the NRO took their keyhole system and focused on the Ararat Anomaly, which is, you know, uh, a puzzle. Well, when the word got out, when, they, when the pictures finally were downloaded, and they computerized and enhanced them and Clara cleaned them up and so, and they, they pushed them on the wall or they broadcast them on the wall there at NRO. The remarks went something like this, and these, these are actual quotes. Jesus Christ, it's a goddamn boat. Christ, it's a big boat. Okay, one would say, why would something like that be so highly classified that it is way above top secret? Why would the discovery of a boat on Mount Ararat be classified so high, far above, you know, anything? Anyhow, the story comes out. The reason they classified it is because after they discovered that it was a goddamn boat, a big goddamn boat, they inserted a team of SEALs on the site. Now, that's a term that the military uses to put a bunch of guys on a, on a scene. Right. Apparently, they dropped them by aircraft. They parachuted down a dozen of them or so. <clears throat> they asserted, inserted them onto the scene, and these guys spent several days in this goddamn boat. And then they extracted them from my helicopters. And when they extracted them, the guys brought with them some anomalous artifacts, which have never been described or named. But those anomalous artifacts is what led to this whole thing being classified not only top secret, but way the hell above. And, and that's a little bit of information that's come out with via the, uh, the network of the old So are boys. you saying this is Noah's Ark? No one knows what it is. It was originally the Ararat anomaly. But then they discovered that it was a gigantic boat, apparently. And but the, and but the, a boat built by humans. Well, it, it appears to be. Mm -hmm. It's essentially, from what they gathered, wood. But it's a, a work of genius, apparently. It was intricately put together, and it's, 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 it's really... And it survived all these years. Well, apparently. The question, how, how many years, you know? When was the flood? The last rumor I heard had was, was 12,000 years ago, 10,500 B.C. But when are they saying... <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure you have a theory. Well, the thing, the religious implications of it, you see, you know, every ancient culture on the planet has a similar tradition about a flood. And I'm sure there were many Noahs, so to speak, wherever. But the idea that this particular thing is so theologically sensitive that some yo-yo back there at NRO decided to classify it. And then, and then they sent the seals in, and the seals brought back uh, artifacts. Well, there you are, you see. What could they have possibly found in this big wreck that is so sensitive? 
question arises. I don't know the answer to that. Hopefully, if the old boy still stays alive a few years, we might find out. I, I find that interesting and I share it with people because it gives you an insight into that bunch of nitwits back there that <laughs> classify everything. Bill, go ahead with your question about Mount Ararat and then we're going to move on from there. Um, I think it was Charles Berlitz who wrote a book, now this is purely from memory, who, which was called The Great Ship of Noah. and. He published a bunch of photographs. These photographs are on the internet um, of something that looks like a ship on Ararat. And there are two versions of this from what I've heard. One is fairly low down, and which is an enormous thing that looks like a whole lot of ship's timbers. Um, and there are persistent reports of um, another object that's much higher up, um, way above the snow line, quite close to the summit. And I wonder if you could say which of these, if either, has been picked up by the Keyhole satellites and analyzed. And when the seals were inserted, <coughs> did, they, did they carbon date the wood? Oh, I'm sure they must have. But I haven't got any information on that. My, my, my guess is, Bill, that uh, the seals were inserted on the one on toward the top, up above the snow line. That's the indication that I got, that the, that was the one that they went in, they landed, they dropped, they parachuted in. Spent a number of days up there, apparently. But what they brought back in the terms of anomalous artifacts is the thing that intrigued me. Why would they classify it so far above top secret? But that bunch of nitwits back there, and I've known some of them over the years. I've worked with some of them. And I think they are a bunch of damn nitwits. You know, there's no damn reason why they've classified so much. Mm -hmm. What year was this when the seals were sent in? About five years ago, from what I can gather. Really? Yeah. That's bizarre. Well, the Keyhole program uh, was really big in the, in the late 90s. Now, I'm sure they've got uh, satellite programs that are even better now. Uh, we've got civilian programs that are so damn good that the Department of Defense will often go to the civilian contractors and buy photographs taken by civilian satellites that are outstanding. So it leads you to suspect maybe what, how much better could be some of our DOD satellites. All right. You know, they have classified Lake Vostok. They took it away from JPL, who was monitoring it and, you know, with satellites and all. You're familiar with Lake Vostok in Antarctica? No. Oh, no. <clears throat> oh, God, that's a, that's a sensitive story in itself. Under the ice in Antarctica, there is an, a freshwater lake deep, deep down under the ice that's 100 miles long, about 50 miles wide. Fresh water. The temperature in the damn lake is about 65 degrees, which is pleasant swimming, you might say. <clears throat> But at the end of Lake Vostok is what's known as a gigantic mass con, a mass concentration of metal, very similar to the mass cons they discovered on the moon. Gigantic circular shaped metallic objects deep under the ice at the end of Lake Vostok. Highly classified. JPL had it. National Security Agency took it away from JPL. It's one of the most sensitive things in the world now as to what is the anomaly at the end of the lake, the mass con, the mass concentration that is so easily picked up by satellites. <clears throat> Another top secret, you know, mm -hmm. the common folk, you're not supposed to know that. Right. Why? Well, you can't handle it, you see. The implications of it are just too vast. Well, tell me this. Um, <clears throat> do the Chinese know it? Oh, I'm sure they do. As you may know, the Chinese now have gone into space in a big way. It, it never gets into the newspaper. But the last I heard, the Chinese have a satellite orbiting the moon, taking lots of pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'm hoping that the, the Chinese publish a lot of those pictures. Because our own NASA people took many, many pictures. The Army took 
thousands of pictures under the Clementine Project. Are you familiar with Clementine? I've heard of it. It was not a NASA program. It was an Army program, hmm. Department of Defense. They took thousands of pictures. They've only released a dozen or so. They took pictures all around the moon, backside, bottom, top, everywhere. Well, are you in touch with <clears throat> Richard Hoagland? I know Richard. He's a good friend. Okay. So you know some of his recent research. Ah, well, I read his recent, recent book, which is Dynamite. Uh-huh. Okay. He, so uh, he, you know he, about the Secret Space Program. Oh, yeah. And you know about the von Braun and the Nazis oh. and what's been carried over to the U.S. Oh, honey, political it's bigger system. than that. Okay. Well, much, much but, bigger. But when I raised up Richard Hoagland's information mm -hmm. and the stuff that he's bringing forward about von Braun, the Nazis, you know, paperclip, and you're saying it's it's much beyond that. So it where is. are we going? Uh, with well, that? our original space program was was all a product of the Nazi Party. Mm -hmm. uh, without von Braun and his crew and the, the paperclip program, I don't think we would have gotten to the moon when we did. Or we certainly wouldn't have beaten the Russians, because the Russians grabbed their crowd. They also went into Germany and grabbed a bunch of scientists. <clears throat> and then the Russians have a tremendous scientific program of their own. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't need Nazi scientists. Uh, they would have eventually done it on their own anyhow. But one of the biggest secrets of all is the secret space program. Uh, the fact that NASA is, it, it's like Blue Book used to be. I think it's a public relations front. Right, yeah. Blue, Blue Book never handled the real good stuff. And uh, everybody knew that. Mm-hmm except the common folk out there who were diddled regularly and never told the truth about anything. <clears throat> but the, the big secret seems to have been for so long is why are we keeping classified the enormous facilities on the moon? And they're not ours. Whose uh, are they? Well, that's a good question. I can tell you flatly who they are. Okay. Uh, are you familiar with the term Anunnaki? Absolutely. All right. Well, you, you really have to understand Zechariah Sitchin's work mm -hmm. to really grasp where we stand today in, in relationship with this group of intelligences. And I'm not speaking of one. There are several. The last I heard, there were four different groups we were relating with. The Anunnaki are one. And there are others. Okay, can, I mean, this, this is very interesting. Can you describe the Anunnaki that you, have you, first of all, have you had exposure to them face to face? Me? Yeah. Yes, I've met some face to face. Okay. Now, whether they were the Anunnaki, I don't know. Okay, well. The ones I've run face to face were typically human. Typically they were, human. I mean, they could put on a suit, tie, a dress. Uh, blue jeans, uh, t-shirt, Okay. walk in our midst and you would never know. And they weren't nine feet tall or higher? No. The ones I've, I've met and the ones I've seen aboard the ships are not that big at all. They're just like us. Uh -huh. So we're dealing with four different groups that I've concluded, my own personal view. Okay. Yeah, you might talk to Jim Sparks and he might tell you there are eight or ten or a dozen more. You know, I don't know. <clears throat> I can only tell you what little bit I've learned over the years. <clears throat> there are four different groups that I've encountered, and they're all humanoid. <clears throat> One group is completely human, and not all of the Anunnaki are nine feet tall. Uh, they, were, they were human enough that we are related to them, and they're related to us, and uh, that 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 lovely little story in chapter 6 of Genesis is quite true. They did indeed uh, engineer the uh, genes and chromosomes of an existing species on this planet. God knows how long ago. Sitchin says it was 200,000 years. The uh, information I have learned indicates that one of the major tweaking went, took place about 60,000 years ago that uh, Homo sapiens sapiens was tweaked and genetically manipulated even more. So we're coming along slowly. Okay, so what four races? Let's, let's name them, in your opinion. 
Well, there are the humans. Okay. Some people call them the Nordics. Then you have guys that are very pale and very tall and very broad, uh -huh. which uh, some, some people refer to as the big whites. Okay. And then you have the, uh, the little guys. The Greys, mm -hmm. and then the Anunnaki. So yeah. those are the four you're mm -hmm. you're familiar with. And the, not all of the Greys are uh, an evolved species. Some of them appear to be what they used the term they used to use. Uh, they were an artificial life form. Androids. Yeah, they were. They were humanoid androids, but they were constructed. They're laboratory products. Mm -hmm. And uh, they often wondered why, in cases of crashes, where there were survivors, that some of them didn't come back and try to retrieve. And the, the story that came out among the military for many years was that uh, they wrote them off. They went back and made more. Now, there are some people who say, well, they don't have a soul. Well, I've run into human beings that I began to wonder whether they had a soul. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, okay, there so are two types of greys from what I've learned. Mm -hmm. There are the little guys who would apparently to be laboratory products. That, uh, and then there are the six-foot greys whose eyes are more round. And they're not really gray. They're just sort of a, a chalky, off-white color. Mm-hmm. And uh, they seem to be uh, an evolved race all of their own. And I think those are the ones that probably ran into Betty Hill and Barney mm. at the incident many years ago. Have you heard about Dan Burish talking about the Orions that are sitting in ships along with the military, actually watching the planet right now? I've heard bits and pieces of that. I don't know too much about Dan's story he's, he's come up with a great many things okay but this is just <clears throat> just new information that he's he's actually come forward with well and they're watching the planet to see what happens and whether or not we have a catastrophe of any kind we, and we whether they got, might have to step there, in. there we have photographs and many of them I'm going to share and show I have slides and photographs that of gigantic objects I'm talking about humongous objects in, in space. And m many of them are in satellites around uh, their orbit around the planet. Many of them are in orbit around the moon, around Mars. I have a couple of pictures that I'm going to share that I got from a Soviet cosmonaut on what happened with the Phobos thing. The Russians, you know, they're, they're famous Phobos rocket system that they sent up there some years back, which got knocked out of orbit by uh, an anomalous object that came up from the surface. But it had, took, it had taken a number of outstanding photographs before it was damaged and crashed. Okay, what, uh, what will, you called it an anomalous, I don't know, object that came up from the surface, meaning the surface of the Mars. moon? Mars. No, from Mars. Earth? Yeah. Okay. No, the Phobos program was sent to Mars because they had hoped to land a lander on the satellite Phobos. There right. Are there are two circling Mars, which are anomalous. Again, that fantastic word, anomalous. Astronomers consider them anomalous because, first of all, they're going in the wrong direction for an actual satellite, whatever that means. They're too small to be natural satellites, and they're too close to the surface of Mars to have survived. Because if they were natural, they would long ago have been brought down and sucked in by gravity and crashed. <clears throat> the fact that they're still there uh, puzzles everybody. So the Russians said, we're going to land on, on Phobos. It's about 12 miles in diameter. <clears throat> I think uh, Deimos is only about six or seven they were going to take some pictures on the surface. Well, you know, apparently the intelligences up there decided, no, you're not going to do that, and uh, bumped Phobos, the, the, the satellite that the, the Soviets sent up, 
knocked it out of orbit and it crashed apparently. But they've been doing that to the <clears throat> JPL craft going up and around Mars um, for there years is, now. There is an intelligence on Mars that wants to limit our access to their reality. And uh, they've done a t damn pretty good job of it. Well, our, our witness, <clears throat> Henry Deacon, and I don't know if you're familiar with him. I'm familiar with him. I'm not, I don't know him well. Okay. Uh, he has said that the Anunnaki are on Mars mm, in they bases. They are. I agree with that. So are they the ones shooting down those objects, you know, the, yes, the various probably. craft from JPL uh, and so on? Look, Zechariah has said, and I know this old man, I, I respect him tremendously. Uh, he says they never left. They've withdrew overtly from their activities on the planet with us, but their activities have continued covertly, both on Earth, the Moon, and Mars. And from the knowledge I have and the limited amount of information I've been able to get, that the primary focus, the primary intelligence behind all of this are the Anunnaki, the same group that genetically engineered us so many thousands of years ago. Okay, but you've got Enki and Enlil, right? And these are warring, <coughs> warring brothers, and one is working for the positive side of humanity. Well, and you the had other... this dysfunctional family. They even went to war with each other. And man was in the middle, as he always has been. You know, we were a product of their engineering. They, they gen engineered us as a slave species. They engineered us to work for them. But aren't they still at war? Apparently there is still, and, and some of our remote viewers, and I know a few of them, <clears throat> I've done a little of it myself. And believe me, it works. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I, I've been accused of being guilty of front-loading, so to speak, because when I want to look at something, I know what I want to look at. The, the military originally trained their guys to, to not know what they were looking for, and then they would download, you know, compare and such. Right. But when I want to look at something, I know exactly what I look want to look at. Uh, one of the greatest, of course, is Ingo Swann. Oh, oh absolutely. Oh, tremendous guy. What an intellect that guy Oh, is. incredible. We're dying to interview him. <clears throat> Do you know? Well, I, he and I have corresponded. I, I wrote a, a nice article about him one time years ago. Uh -huh. And he wrote me a letter and thanked me for it and told me he appreciated Lovely. it a lot. Yes. But he is a rare man. He's oh, a rare intellect. Yes. Not only is he probably the best remote viewer we've ever had, perhaps other than Pat Price, right. that uh, Ingo's come up with stuff on the moon. That, that you, you have to read his book. Uh, Actually, I have. Penetration. Yes. It's dynamite. And it's hard to get a hold of. Yeah, well, it, it, yeah it, it yeah. should be reissued because it'd sell like hotcakes. Absolutely. I spoke about it on Coast to Coast a couple of times with Art Bell. And apparently it, it became so damn hot that, you know, you can't find a copy. Any, two or three hundred dollars each if yeah. you can find one. Yeah. Well, I have, I, I don't know if I still have it, but I had one. Yeah, well, hold on to it. It's gold. Uh-huh. But Ingo is gold himself. He okay, is, but, but let's, let's kind of like move back to the question because I, I want to get sort of drilled down to this answer. So they're still at war. They still have a difference of opinion about us. Now, whether Enlil and Enki, Ia, Enki uh -huh. he goes by two names, Ia, okay. whether they still are alive or not, right. with, with the genetic geniuses that they have been, that they are, they can genetically manipulate, the, you know, they gen, in, ingeniously genetically manipulated their own chromosomes, DNA, so they literally have become practically immortal. Now, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that Enki and Enlil may still be alive. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're running around with a cane like I do and grunting and groaning. <laughs> you know, they got the great, 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 great grandkids doing the, the running. And I don't know that. And I'm sure that no one else does. But apparently the factions are still divided. And the, the one side wants to use us, as they always did, and the other side wants to give us the opportunity 
to be our own species, to, to chart our own future, and to call, you know, to determine our own lives. Mm -hmm. And there apparently has this been difference of opinion going on. So when we get back to the <coughs> national security state and the state of the U.S. right here and now, I mean, you're, you're an, an ex-military, I, I, I hardly want to call you ex because I think you're in some ways probably still consulted here and there. Um, you know, we're about to go to war with Iran. What's no, your, we're not. What's your perspective on this? We're not? No, we're not. Okay. And uh, that's my opinion, mm -hmm. in it, for whatever it's worth, you know. I, sure. I have a, a, half penny, a half penny in my pocket that I don't believe that we're going to have a nuclear war because I don't think the custodians will allow it. Right. The planet is too valuable. It's too rich a reservoir of life. Not only the humans here on this planet, but all the other creatures. That, this, this planet is, is an absolute cornucopia of, of beautiful, beautiful forms of life. And not only that, but, but the, uh, what is it, the, the fauna and the, uh, what's the other term? Flora. The plant, the flora. Uh -huh. The flora is infinite almost. Yeah. No, the planet's too valuable. Okay. They, they've got a lot invested in planet Earth. And they're not about to let it go to a nuclear war because they have the power to see that it does not happen. And I want to tell you something else. You've heard this old rumor about the uh, Prime Directive? Mm -hmm. Bullshit. It doesn't <laughs> exist. Right. Okay. They have been interfering here, breaking the so-called Prime Directive, over the centuries, so thousands of times. They have been interfering, according to our historical records, back to ancient Greece. They probably had a hand in that damn dust-up at Troy. You know, they took sides. There were even rumors in Homer's <clears throat> reports that uh, the god, gods themselves came down and uh, took sides and played in the game. To them, it's a game. Right. Well, the Bhagavad Gita, <clears throat> if you're familiar there you are. with it, it's I mean, filled with going... it. the Vedas are filled with it, you see. Absolutely. Richard Thompson is a genius. He's, he's written a book about it. Ah. Alien Identities, it's called. Okay, I'll get take a, a look. Read it if you get a yes, chance. I'd Richard Thompson. Okay, now he, I'm going to change helped, gears. He, he worked with Cremo on their... Oh, really? Yeah, they were the, they were jointly wrote that book on the Hidden History of the Human Race. Oh, okay. Cremo and Thompson wrote that. Well, Richard wrote a book of his own called Alien Identities, and it's filled with Vedic facts, which uh -huh. you would enjoy. Yes. But the history's pretty clear. They've intervened over the centuries again and again and again wherever it seemed appropriate to their be benefit on their behalf. And they've, okay, they've but, gotten in our wars, they've messed around in that whole mess. Okay, but what about um, Planet X? Oh, it's a reality. Yeah? Yeah. So what are they going to do about that? Well, apparently they are concerned about, <clears throat> you know the story, according to Sitchin and according to the Sumerians, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. Well, our astronomers apparently have concluded that it is indeed a reality. For almost a century, astronomers have been concerned and interested about what they called an intruder that seems to come and go from time to time. And they can, they can measure it by the perturbations and the effects on other planets. <clears throat> They've known its existence for a long time but they've never gone public about it. Well, in the early 80s, the JPL, the guy, guys at Joint Pro Jet Propulsion, Jet Propulsion Lab. used to call it uh, Jack Parsons Laboratory. Yes. Which I think is probably where the original JPL came from. Yes. Because Jack Parsons established it. Anyhow, they, they sent out a couple of pioneers, satellites, back in 82 just to try to determine if there was some truth to it. Mm -hmm. And the pioneers apparently came back with data which said not only yes, but hell yes. <laughs> and the pioneers concluded, the pioneer satellite data concluded. So, wow, 
astronomers were troubled by that. Whew. Could this thing be real? And well, what did they did? They uh, they sent out what they called an infrared astronomical satellite. I think they called it IRAS. And, uh, and this was done in the 83. <clears throat> they sent the IRAS out, taking infrared pictures <clears throat> all around the ecliptic, above and below. And apparently IRAS got two giant positive responses that yes, the, the twelfth planet, the tenth planet, however you want to call it, yes, it's real. And that's when the, the lid slams down. So it's <clears throat> out there, it's on its way back in, right? According to the Sumerians and Sitchin, it, apparently it is. <clears throat> and uh, if you're a student of history, as I, one of my majors, its last pass was 1600 B.C. The Sumerians and Sitchin and all of those say it has an orbit of 3,600 years. Mm -hmm. So as, like many of us, you know, I count on my fingers and toes and figure out, well, 1600 B.C., it has an orbit of 3,600 years. Wow! It's due. Well, apparently it is. So now, why are they keeping this a secret? Because if you're the, an expert on secrets. Listen. Every time Nibiru would make a pass, it was not always devastating. Mm -hmm. It would depend on whether the planet Earth and Nibiru were on the same side of the sun at the same time. Mm -hmm. And if we were on the same side of the sun at the same time, all hell would break loose on planet Earth. Well, apparently, the last pass triggered the explosion of Santorini, Thera, the volcano in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean Sea, blew its top, brought to a close the great, great Minoan civilization. Among other things, it affected Egypt. It's all in the records, apparently. There are even historians and theologians who say that Santorini's explosion is exactly what you're reading about when the plagues and all hit Egypt that allowed Moses to get the Israelites out. But if you look at 1600 BC and figure, and that was a relatively recent past, it's due now, and apparently the guys in the astronomical observatories know it and that, again, is above top secret. Let me give you a tiny example. For a number of years ago, there were two brilliant guys working at the Naval Observatory in Washington. Uh, Tom Van Flandern is one who I hope you've interviewed. No, but um, <clears throat> yeah, please continue, and we'd love to do He's that. He's no longer with the uh, Naval Observatory. The other one was a chief astronomer at the observatory, a brilliant man by the name of Robert. Harrington. Right. And Harrington gave an interview to Zechariah Sitchin a number of years ago, I think it was 91 or so, mm -hmm. where he came right out and said, Dr. Sitchin, we, we are interested in this because it ties in perfectly with the work you've done on the Sumerians and the ancient planet Nibiru. He said, we found it. It's real. We have photographs of it. And he says, from what we can put together, it, it's a rather nice planet. <clears throat> it's about two and a half times the size of the Earth. Apparently, it's uh, heading toward the system, the center of the system. <clears throat> we, uh, we've concluded about everything about it, except that we haven't named it. And Zechariah spoke up and he says, it's already been named. He says, you simply call it Nibiru, as the Sumerians called it, the planet of the crossing. Mm -hmm. Well, Mrs. Sitchin and I were in agreement. I, I miss her. She died about a year ago. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she was convinced that Robert Harrington had died because somebody bumped him off because he had the courage to come out and give Zechariah this interview. I don't know whether you've seen it or not. It's on tape. 
No, I haven't <coughs> seen it, but we interviewed uh, Lucas Scantamberlo about this subject, mm -hmm. and, and he's also talked about Robert Harrington. Yeah, he, well, Harrington gave the interview to Zechariah, and it's on a, a video called Are We Alone? Mm -hmm. And I think you can pick it up at the conference here next week. Okay. I have a copy, and I sent a copy to uh, Neil, Neil Freer, who's a man you should interview. Okay, well, we're in touch with Neil. He's a very interesting guy. <coughs> oh, he's brilliant. He's a brilliant guy. He's brilliant. He, uh, he just recently came out and admitted that he's had a, an intimate interrelationship with extraterrestrial intelligence since he was a child. Well, he's always talking about the Anunnaki. I do know this. Well, he, he wrote a book called Breaking the God Spell. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he, he has supported Zachariah's work for years. I have a question, Bobby, if I, uh, if I may, about the provenance of this information, in the sense that Zachariah Sitchin's work is very well documented, and a lot of people watching this video will be very familiar with, with his books and with um, all the intelligent commentary about that. Are you saying that you have additional information based on your contacts within the Old Boys Network, or are you doing a neat presentation. Of Many of my conclusions are my own, you know, and they, in many respects, correlate perfectly with Sitchin's work, <clears throat> which is, you know, Neil has told me, he says, you know, Zachariah really should get the Nobel Prize, mm. but I don't know what they would grant it to him in what field, but he's such an outstanding scholar and what he's done and his the Earth Chronicles is what he calls all of his work. Well, I think there's seven or eight of them now. I have two questions. One's a minor one to do with celestial mechanics. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that I've never understood, and I've heard this from, I've heard this question from many other people as well. That if Nibiru comes from the outer reaches of the solar system, it's going to be an icy rock which isn't going to be the kind of place that any beings could live on or would want to live on. And researcher Andy Lloyd, who you probably have heard about, has theorized that what they're seeing in the photographs that you refer to as an orange object is actually a brown dwarf with the possibility of Nibiru being one of its moons, if you like. And there's a lot of debate about how to apply what Sitchin seems to have been saying to the real practicalities of life on an icy rock out in the orbit of Pluto. And I wondered if you knew or had anything to say about that. No, it's not an icy rock. <clears throat> and yes, when it makes its long journey out and back, it gets so far away from the sun that the sun is probably no more than little tiny prick of light, a little tiny pinpoint. And if you, you would think that it would be naturally icy cold. No, it, it, apparently the planet, like many planets in the system here, generate its own heat. It has in its core a generating heat system very much like our own. We have a system within the core of this planet that is a it has been described as a thermonuclear reaction, very similar to the sun. Now, most of the life and all of the bounty and all of the beauty of life on this planet comes from our going around this beautiful sun. But uh, I don't think Nibiru is an icy rock, no. I, I think, first of all, that it probably generates enough of its own heat and I think they probably did indeed uh, create for themselves with the advanced technology that they have uh, a, a kind of a Dyson sphere. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. You know what brilliant British astronomer, I think, Freeman Dyson said some years ago, that an incredibly advanced technology will have the ability to enclose its planet and retain not only its heat, but its atmosphere. And I suspect that the Anunnaki have done that to Nibiru, and they probably did it, good enough, hundreds of thousands, maybe a million years ago. 
So the, the planet, I think the, the color from it, the, the dull red golden color is a result of that envelope of, of gold shell that they've created. They've created for themselves a Dyson sphere around their planet. And I suspect that any advanced technology will ultimately do the same. Simply because it makes sense. It's a practical thing. But, but if they had that degree of engineering capability, why wouldn't they just live on Mars instead of hurtling through the solar system? Well, they weren't the original occupants of Mars. Okay. They used Mars as a way, st a way station. And they've reactivated it, and I agree with Zechariah on that, that they've reactivated their way system, their way station there. They used to drop off on Mars on their way here. <clears throat> so they were never, I don't think, original inhabitants of the Mars. No, 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 I, uh, the, there, there are a few remnants of original inhabitants on Mars. There's even some indications which I've been looking into, then I've gotten some data <clears throat> that uh, we're playing host to a bunch of Martians here on this planet. Mm. <clears throat> I'm talking you, about the original yeah. species. Do you know anything about the original Martian species? Or have you... Have Other than the only thing, I, I've talked to a couple of remote viewers who have apparently been able to come face to face with them, so to speak, mm. and they ended up looking a lot like American Indians. They and I may have met a Martian, but <laughs> I've known so many strange people in my life. And, uh, <clears throat> sure, I mean, I understand this well enough to know not to laugh at a comment like that, that's for sure. So, um, That, believe it or not, was meant to be a minor question. I have a more major one, something that I thought you might want to talk about, or maybe I had misunderstood you uh, a little earlier on, I think, in a conversation that Kerry had reported with you. Some... Serious researchers, Linda Howe, Jim Mars, quite a lot of other people are really suspecting that there may be a hoaxed alien invasion as a kind of major celestial 9-11 event in our sky. You're talking about a fa false flag kind of a situation. False flag, yes. And if we were to pull that off, if any of our idiot nitwits back there think that they could pull that off, I, I think they'd make absolute damn fools of themselves because I don't believe it would work. I don't think you can do that when you've got the real power out there that wouldn't allow that to happen. Not so much an invasion, but a big display in the sky to create fear and to make people easier to control. <clears throat> Robert Carol Rosin said that she had always been told by Werner von Braun many years ago. Yeah, Werner shared that apparently before he died, that he, it was one of the programs that the, the government at the time was considering. You know, they've had these little plots they've been working on all the time. Uh, this war, that war, the stock market crash, this, that, you know, all these little magician things that while I'm showing you this hand, I'm picking your pocket with this one. I, they may have had that in mind at that time, but I don't think they're thinking of it seriously now because I think that there are so-called powers that be, which is a joke, are in such close relationship and collusion with the real power that it would never work, that they would never allow it. It's like they're not going to allow a thermonuclear war. Yeah. There's too much valuable real estate here. Not just this rich gold mine of human genetics. What a ripe reservoir we are of, of genes and God. The whole species plus all of the other fauna and all of the other flora. This is a valuable planet and they, they love it. They own it. We've never owned it. We just live on it. They farm us, so to speak. God. Uh, <laughs> Charles Fort was right, to some degree. We are property. And we're going to remain property 
until we reach a point where we can literally stand up and say, all right, we're going to do this now ourselves and prove it to the, the universe. We're dealing with a universe filled with life and most of it is so far beyond our own. I used an analogy one time <clears throat> and I said, they look upon us like we look upon headhunters in New Guinea. Now you've seen the films, you know, history, St. Channels and all the rest. They're, they're, they're naked, they're running around with these stupid things on their penises and, you know, bones through their, whatever. Pathetic, sad, primitive, savages. They're, they're not to be feared. They're, they're not to be abused. They're to be nurtured and cared for. Well, the difference between some of them out there and us is the difference between us and these poor guys in New Guinea and those rainforests out there. Now, I, I joked about that, and then I learned later that that wasn't really a very accurate comparison. I learned later that I didn't even come close to an appropriate comparison. That the real comparison between many of them out there and us is closer to how we feel about the chimpanzee. And Bill, if you allow your mind to take those trips, and I know you do, there are creatures and life forms out there that are literally godlike. A lot of the remote viewers who've encountered them, and I've seen a few of them myself, look upon them as transcendentals. They, they manifest, manifest as living energy life forms, forms of light. They're the same kind that appeared when Jesus was walking around. Probably the same kind of guys that showed up with poor... Uh, was it Joseph Smith? I didn't know the history of the Mormon faith. Uh, poor Joe had a an event one time happening in his bedroom where two brilliant, beautiful, tall, glimmering, glistening beings of pure light appeared in his bedroom. Those are transcendentals. Now the difference between them and us is between us and the rhesus monkey. So I think I'm getting close, maybe not, but I'm thinking I'm getting close to a, an analogy that may be more realistic. You know, I have nothing but hope because I'm an immortal being. I, I, I'm an infinite life form. If you could see me the way I really am, Bill, it wouldn't be in this pathetic body with the... Uh, it's only our bodies we're describing, not Oh, us. that's right. Not you know, us. this is just a shell. I've had it for 79 years. I've used it badly, and I've abused it over <laughs> the years. And I'm beginning to pay the lessons, or the prices for that. But if you could see me as I can see you, and we are shimmering beings of light. Yeah. Absolutely. Totally. Well, okay, I have a question <clears throat> for you, because he's got a book out called End of Days. Yes. And in that book, he actually talks about Nibiru and the return, but he doesn't say that it's actually going to happen now. He says he thinks it's about 2060. That was his estimate. Okay, and so where, where, we, where does this information that you have <clears throat> and 2012, how do we put this all together? Because I, I'm going to say something about what you're telling us because it, it's clear that you're something of an intelligence analyst yourself. You certainly have an incredible background. You can cross correlate and, and so on. But you also have some insider contacts and you also have um, contact with Anunnaki as you said. All right. So where are you getting your information and are they saying anything specific about what's happening 2012? Because I'm not so, so sure about Zachariah's conclusion. That's 2060, but apparently uh, it could be before that. The Department of Defense is quite concerned about it, mm -hmm. that uh, there are entire sections of the Defense Department that are working on that subject 
and particularly. The big question is, are we and it going to be on the same side of the sun at the same time? And some of our remote viewers have concluded that yes, it's going to happen this time. That we and it will be on the same side of the sun at the same time. And if the remote viewer, and they're getting their information from ETs, and much of my information from this same source. And yes, we're in for some bad times. And we're talking about while we're still here on the planet, because we, I don't know that we'd be <clears throat> alive during 2016. Well, I don't know whether I'll still be here or not. You know, I'll be 80 in, in March, and, uh, you know, I've, I've got a ticket out of here. Right. I've got it okay. stamped. I've got it paid. But I'm, there's, there's... I'm nine years beyond my warranty as it is. <laughs> no, but I think you're going to live quite a while. Um, <clears throat> so what... Okay, so we've got this, this interesting thing going on, and we're getting, we have a huge crackdown on anything to do with Planet X. It's yes. been made the laughing stock. It's, it's an amazing thing. Really. Oh, the ridicule is... is it, I mean, I think it supersedes even the E.T. ridicule. Oh, it does. It you does. Know, I think it, it's been so strong, and it actually has come, I would say, from the Vatican. Mm-hmm. So what are they so afraid of, number one? And number two, have you heard the theory that basically what has to happen is a protective shield is going to be put around the earth such that this time it's actually not going to have the impact that they <clears throat> it has in the past? I've heard that rumor in passing. And the technology exists to do that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I have a suspicion is that much of what will transpire will be allowed to transpire. <clears throat> the earth is not going to be destroyed and the human race is not going to come to an end. But it is going to be a difficult period of time when it begins. And let me tell you, it has already begun. The reaction from the sun is, is, is a clear response to the presence of this other body. Now this other body has already been photographed by telescopes in southern Chile and in New Zealand. I had asked Marcia to dig into her files. I, 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 had a, I had an article from a good friend who publishes a magazine in Rome. And uh, Adriano, I don't know whether you know about Adriano For Forgione, Brilliant young man. <clears throat> yes. Anyhow, he has connections with the Vatican. <clears throat> he has good friends who are Jesuit priests and astronomers. And the Vatican is concerned about it. Anyhow, Adriano sent me an article including two photographs that have been taken of Nibiru already. Mm -hmm. Taken by uh, primarily, I think, the this observatory in Chile. But they've taken pictures at an observatory in New Zealand as well. So it's close enough now that optical telescopes have pictures of it. And they're studying it carefully to try to determine, what is it they call it, the celestial mechanics of how everything moves. Well, <clears throat> if our remote viewers are correct and the ETs have given us some rundown on it, it's going to be a difficult passing. Because we and it are going to be on the same side of the sun at the same time, and that means all hell's going to break loose. Now, they have the technology. We're talking about not only Anunnaki. There are intelligences out there that began a billion years ago, and they have technology that puts them in a category of what Kaku would call a Type Three civilization. Mm -hmm. So that a type 3 civilization has the technology to ameliorate, or mitigate the passing of Nibiru. Now whether they do that, as you say, put a protective, protective shield around it, Nibiru has done that for itself. They have a protective shield around their planet, <clears throat> which was why in the photographs it comes out as kind of reddish gold. And apparently that's why they came here for the gold in the first place, because they were losing their atmosphere 
and they needed to seed gold particles in their atmosphere to keep the atmosphere from, you know, they go on a long trip out there. Okay, but the Anunnaki are here, you're saying, and yet the Anunnaki are supposedly on Nibiru as well, well or, or what, what are you thinking, or what are you, what's your sources telling you about this? The civilization, the Anunnaki civilization, is on the planet. But the Anunnaki are on this planet as well, all over the damn place, under the sea, at facilities that we know about, inside Mount Hayes in Alaska, inside Mount Perdido in the Pyrenees. Uh, there's one right in the middle of Australia, which is near, what, uh, Alice Springs. And what, what's the facility out there? Pine Gap. Pine Gap, yes, thank you, my friend. Pine Gap. To, to and that happens to be the R and R facility according to the remote viewers. The, what's R and R? I'm R sorry. R rest and relaxation. <laughs> so what we used to call it in the military when we The R and R facility <coughs> for who? What the Anunnaki? For the ET really? and the Anunnaki's, yes. Pine Gap. And they're dealing with human beings, they need rest and relaxation. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyhow, the rumor is that Pine Gap is primarily an R and R facility. Hmm. Have you been there? I've been to Australia. I haven't been to Pine Gap, no. Would you lie to me? Mm, sometimes, maybe, but not right now, no. Okay. <clears throat> no, I haven't been to Pine Gap. A lot of my work has been a result of analyzing and sifting and evaluating the work of others. That's what an intelligence analyst does takes data from a variety of sources, but I have some information that I have been provided from sources within the US, U.S. government that tell me that yes, they are deeply concerned about it and they're worried sick about it and they don't know what to do about it because we don't have the power to do a damn thing about it. <clears throat> Is the estimated date as best you are given to understand by your sources in the next few years, rather than Sitchin's estimate of 2060? <clears throat> well, let me tell you something about, you're talking about 2012? I'm talking, well, there are some, <clears throat> kind of, there are some serious Planned X researchers who say that we'll see the thing next year, and the thing's going to start... I think you may see it next year, but I don't think you're going to have the hell breaking loose until maybe about 2020. You're going to have a, a build-up of factors. It's not going to happen all of a sudden, just like that. You're not going to go out the front door and all hell's breaking loose. You're going to see a, a series of events taking place involving our geologic s structures. You're going to have increased volcanic, volcanic activity. You're going to have increased sunspot activity. We're at a low right now. Mm -hmm but you're going to see tremendous sunspot activity, you're going to see tremendous geologic activity, the ring of fire will probably erupt. Now these are all going to be clues that <clears throat> all hell is coming, you know. <clears throat> you're going to have storms, the, cy the cyclones have been getting worse and the hurricanes have been getting worse, and <clears throat> you're going to be having hurricanes showing up in places that they really haven't troubled us for a long, long time. So you're going to have a con a build-up, uh, <clears throat> not slowly, but it, a consistent build-up of geological and weather and sunspot activities. And you're probably going to, the estimate that I've heard from people who have studied it is about 2020. Okay, but we have heard that Sitchin, as well-meaning as he may be, is working for the government. And my understanding would be is that they don't <coughs> want this information out. So they're doing everything in their power to make sure that it's ridiculed as we've observed. Carrie, what, what could the government or anyone else tell you? What could they say to you? Would, would they tell you that grab your hat, dig a hole, hang on? Would, well, would, would anything they is say... Is that what the underground bases is all about? Well... I have always had the conviction, and I've put this together over the years, 
that the, the so-called elite, the creme de la creme, when they're self-designated, you know, <clears throat> they have been preparing for chaos for years. It initially was initiated by the uh, thermonuclear threat with the Soviets. Underground, uh, you know, fallout shelters where we could go. We had our own air conditioning. We can have our own su food supplies and our own water supplies. That was a, a program that began that I worked very closely with when I was with FEMA over the years. I've been in underground facilities you wouldn't believe. Mm -hmm. And there are facilities everywhere that are not known. I mean, there's a big facility right under Fort Huachuca here in Arizona. I mean, a massive one. Never come out. I'm telling it now, but, you know, there's a deep, deep, massive underground facility under Fort Huachuca. <clears throat> They're all over the place. And, and I went to a Department of Energy school at uh, Camp Mercury in Nevada. That was the first time I visited Site 51. Mm -hmm. I may have shared that with you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anyhow, I went to school in uh, well, 79. Camp, uh, Department of Energy school on the radioactive emergency disaster response, anyhow. So you went into the underground base at 51? No, right? I talked to the guys who built some of them. I also took a bus ride over the pass from, from Camp Mercury, which is the atomic test facility there, over the I went into Site 51, Groom Lake, from the rear. And uh, it was no big thing, just a tremendous facility there. Most of it was underground. And the, the hangars. So, so okay. First, they reacted <coughs> to the Soviet threat and all that, and the nuclear. It'll build war. up slowly, and it's it's already subtly begun, and uh, they don't want to talk about it. No one wants to share it. I mean, look for God's sake, what they the the lid they've kept on the reality of ET activity on the moon and Mars. Mm -hmm. Oh, with the ridicule factor. And, and the lid coming down, and, and I think Menlover did lose his life because he said too much. He says, oh, it seems to be a rather nice planet, and we know about it, and it, all we need to do is name it. And then bless his heart, you know, he, he had never had a heart problem, but within a year he was dead with a heart attack. You know, when Ike met that crowd at Murak, which is now Edwards, right. in 54, he met the Anunnaki. Mm. Poor Ike, not long after that, had a heart attack. Mm. It was more than he was able to deal with. The shock of that reality took a toll on him. Mm. And that's one of the reasons why the Brookings Report reached the conclusion it did. You can't tell those poor folks out there all this. They couldn't handle it. Well, BS, they can handle it. Damn. Human beings can handle anything. I mean, we. I have we've, to agree with you. We've gone through hell over the centuries. We, if we could handle Attila the Hun, and 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 Adolf Hitler. We can handle anything. We've been designed to handle anything. We haven't been designed to live very long. <clears throat> but then again, there's another story there. Right. Where did you think that this tremendous outpouring of knowledge on the double helix, our RNA, our DNA, and all of that has been coming forth? Is there some connection with the fact that maybe we now have a relationship with the guys who originally designed us in the first place? Sure. Of course we have. <clears throat> We're now in the process of redesigning and engineering our own DNA and we're being told how we're being shown how and thank God they're sharing it with us now because the first time poor old Adama and Iwa wanted the knowledge they threw him out of the garden as it were you know and that's another thing I want to talk about briefly in passing is that there's no such thing as original sin and that's a crock of manure that's been forced down your throats for thousands of years. There's no such thing as original sin. The human race never fell. It was pushed. 
<laughs> and this, this species that you and I are a part of, this beautiful, wonderful, hopefully incredible race of humans, does have a future. And it is in the stars. Mm -hmm. And we are going out there to reclaim our rightful place. That's where we should have been in the first place. Okay, and this gets into the secret space program and <coughs> terraforming. Because there is some terraforming going on. For preparing for what might happen if Nibiru comes through. And if the Earth is in such a state. We're talking about terraforming Mars. Maybe beyond? Have you heard things about yes, this? Yes, terraforming is a fine art. It's been going on for millions of years. The earth itself was terraformed. Right. You know, it was prepared. The garden was prepared for life. Mm -hmm. And then life was introduced and has been nurtured since from the very beginning. Terraforming is a, is a fine art. And some of those guys out there who've been around a billion years pretty good at it. So, you see, I don't know whether they're planning to re-terraform re us after Nibiru passes, or are they going to try to help alleviate the damage in the meantime? I would sus suspect that the latter. Mm -hmm. Maybe they are planning through their engineering genius, and my God, the fact is that, you know, they've got artificially constructed objects in space in the rings of Saturn that are over 2,000 miles long. Spaceships, 2,000 miles long. I have pictures I'll share in next week. Okay, what about um, John Walson? You know, are you familiar with his pictures of the craft around the sun? I've heard of it, but I haven't okay. seen them. Just wondering. We've got, we've got objects I have photographs taken by Apollo 13 of, of alien ships five miles long, and I'm showing those over in San Jose. Wonderful. Now, those were taken by our own astronauts. Now, you get the guys on Apollo 13, and they're all, from what I understand, all three still alive. And you won't get a one of them to admit who snapped the shutter on that camera, but the film is there, and the, the negative number is there, the uh, roll number is there, and there it is. NASA photograph of a five-mile-long artificial spaceship. Now, and that's only, that's small. Well, well let's talk about <clears throat> the astronauts for a minute, because what's going on with Clark McClelland, and, and why is he having such a problem coming forward? I didn't know Clark was having a problem. He has I, a book I, I, that he's trying to write. He's uh, he's he's penniless. He's had a terrible time. Um, they don't want him to talk. No, they probably don't. Okay, and have you met? You know, have you talked to the astronauts? What about Edgar Mitchell? I, have you I, talked I, to Ed, Edgar I, Mitchell? I, I, I talked before he died with Gordon Cooper. Uh, I was on the phone a few times with Cooper. He even sent me a fo autograph photograph of himself. I admired him because he, he was one of the mavericks who had the courage to come out and say what he had seen. <clears throat> I've known Ed Mitchell for some years. Every time I get a chance to see him, I <clears throat> chat with him, and I consider him a delightful man. He's are very they, warm and terribly they, bright. Are they mind-controlled? Are, to some degree, has their mind, have their Cooper, minds been wiped? Cooper never was. Okay. They they never got to Gordon, and I don't think they got to Neil Armstrong either. Mm. But all of the rest of them, to some level, have been kind of, well, what's the word I'm looking for here? They have been <clears throat> conditioned not to speak. And in some cases, they may have been hypnotically affected to not remember. Hmm. Uh, dark mission, Hoagland says, and the evidence is pretty clear, that they hypnotically debriefed is what they call it. But the, supposedly they were hypnotized to help them enhance their memory and to recall. And 
apparently some of them had been hypnotically advised not to remember certain things. Uh, as much as I admire Ed Mitchell and respect him, tremendous, wonderful guy, <clears throat> he has admitted publicly in front of other people <clears throat> that his time on the moon, walking on the moon, was kind of vague. He, he, can't, he can't recall everything. And of course, uh, that's sad. I don't think they ever got to uh, Neil Armstrong. Because when he, when he got back, he left the program, said, to hell with it, I'm out of here. He went back to Cincinnati and started teaching math at the university there. And, and, and Armstrong hasn't said five words publicly since. Uh-huh. And then you have a case of uh, Aldrin. Now, uh, Aldrin has had experiences where he has been with friends. And the subject would come up. And Buzz would start to cry. Or he would get nauseated. One time, and, and Hoagland touches upon this, I think, chapter 10 in the book, <clears throat> where Aldrin was in conversation with a few people and with his wife, having a few drinks, and he's just kind of relaxed. And somebody asked him a blunt, straight-to-the-point question, and he had to run out and throw up. He, he got sick. Mm -hmm. Now, this, to me, is, is a result, and I've studied it enough over the years to know that that sounds to me like a hypnotic suggestion. Mm -hmm. He has been hypnotically conditioned not to remember or to not even discuss it. And if he gets nauseated, and in the one instance with a bunch of old friends, old flyboy types, he ended up starting to cry. Hmm. Now this breaks my heart because Aldrin is a good man. He was one of our better men to be selected for that program. Mm -hmm. You know, you know the story, and uh, this is common knowledge. They got back from Apollo 11. They put Aldrin in a sanitarium for about six weeks. Hmm. He, had, he was suffering from alcoholism. Do you believe that? <laughs> Do you believe one of our best and bravest, one of the finest, mm. who in the Apollo program suffered from alcoholism? Nonsense! You know, that apparently it was the, uh, the programming to be reinforced. Now, why would a grown man with his background break down and cry like a baby or end up getting nauseous and barf <clears throat> on the subject? That's hypnotic, uh, post-hypnotic stress. So what is it on the moon that is, <clears throat> you know, that is so important that they want to completely whitewash it out? Oh, my God. We... we the astronomical societies, the, the professional astronomers in this country have, have been guilty of criminal activity. You may quote me. They've been guilty of criminal activity for years to not discuss the reality of what they knew on the moon. <clears throat> there are major facilities and major activities going on on the moon all the time. Not only that, the moon has water. Now, whether it's a natural process from the satellite, or whether it's water that's been stored there for use, there are vaporous signs of a form of an atmosphere in the bottom of some of the craters. Now, astronomers have seen these pictures, but, but that dishonest bunch of nitwits won't discuss it. They're scared because you know why? 90% of their income comes from government grants. And when you've got a government grant, and that's your so prime source of, of income, you're going to say whatever the government says you should say or don't say whatever the government doesn't want said. Well, anyhow, there is a, there's some atmosphere on the moon, at least in the base of several of the 
of the larger craters. There is water on the moon, but there is major activity going on. I mean, we're talking about engineering activity. There are giant sh ships that come and go out of the craters. Mm -hmm. There are lights all the time. There, they have noticed bridges appearing and then disappearing. I mean, they're active as hell on the moon. What but the same activity is going on on Mars. Sure. Did you, you, you've seen my photograph, I guess. It's not only my photograph. But there is a city the size of Chicago underground on Mars that's generating so much heat it shows up in infrared photographs. <coughs> Are you in touch with John Lear? I've met John. I've been in his house a time or two. I visited him. I, I have a tremendous respect for him. The reason I like John is he's been nailed as I have as a damn fool maverick, you know? Uh, <coughs> So, the, I mean, this is his pet, you know, project. The, the establishment the has tried to ridicule John Lear, and you can't ridicule John Lear because he's got sources similar to some of my own that are beyond question. He's getting people inside, fe feeding him information almost on a regular basis. Uh -huh. I get mine in bits and pieces when I go to conferences and when I meet people, you know. But John gets it direct. Okay, I have a question for you about Arlington Institute and what's happening in, might be happening in October because we have a lot of information coming at us about October and about something that may, may be planned. Um, I don't know if you, you've heard some of this stuff. Uh, we have our top secret witnesses are coming at us saying, you know, that the economy is being engineered to crash here in the U.S., Oh, this that, whole thing has been engineered. All right. It's been diddled. You know, this, this is a joke. And, and the poor guy out there, the poor working man on the street, as it were, is being screwed royally. But, you know, this whole thing. Carrie, I would almost come to a point that 90% of what you call reality are, are threats with the Russians, the, the Georgia invasion, uh, the stock market collapse, all of this is all engineered. So tell us about it. So <clears throat> tell us about Georgia because, the, okay, to get back to, I know you know the guy who's head of or was head of the Arlington Institute. They are sending out a newsletter saying, inviting people to tell them what dreams and visions they're having about October mm. because October has become such a hot month in in, in tracking, there's something called half past human. Have you heard of them? In passing, just they're to... they're doing you know uh, they do language um, they track with web bots all over the internet, basically tracking where a language is going. They've been doing it since '98 with computers and so on, and they 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 were able to chart like before 9/11 this huge mm. raise in consciousness this that some event was imminent. What they, they're getting from October, for October is the same thing, only something even more long-range mm. in its effect. Well, I have and, a tremendous respect for John Peterson. He's brilliant. I, all right. I've known him so if Ar years. Arlington Institute is suddenly asking <clears throat> for people's dreams and visions about October, why Marcia are they doing is, it? Marcia is more in touch with John now than I am. He's a computer person. You know. I understand. I won't touch the damn thing because, as I told you earlier, I, I, I enjoy my privacy. And if you're on the World Wide Web, you don't have any privacy. Okay, so anyhow, I, I agree with you there. So, okay, <clears throat> but, but you know him, and, and here I'm, I'm just basically, <clears throat> you're saying this thing is engineered. So what happened in Georgia? What do you know about it? Oh, it was all engineered. Okay, so the Russians, you know, were, were tipped off. Uh, the president of Georgia did what he did just to lure the Russians in. Right. And he went in. The Russians could not have ignored him, for God's sake. He invaded one of their little, well... So what's the purpose behind it, though? We know what happened, but why? I think, what, what could the purpose be other than to detract people's attention from this over here to this over here? Okay, and while this our, over here While is... our economy was falling around its, your knees, we're all paying attention to the Russians invading poor little Georgia. Okay. Well, the Russians didn't invade poor little Georgia. They, they went out and whacked the president of Georgia's little 
pee pee as it were, stopped that and they pulled back. You know, right. that was. You know how the magician works. He gets you in front of his. You know, he he's Very got good. and yes. he's doing this with his hand while he's picking your pocket with this one. That's right. And that's what the government is doing. And when I say government, it's not the government you think you got. Mm -hmm. It's not the you know. That's all a facade in itself. Mm -hmm. The government we've got is probably being totally run by the Anunnaki. Because okay. there is a power beyond power that's pulling the strings. Right. They call them the Illuminati. But there are guys above the Illuminati that are really in power. Okay, but we're told the <clears throat> Vatican is, is, is behind a lot of it. And that... In, in other words, the Vatican is behind what's going on in the U.S., that there's a plan, and you've got the Anunnaki. This is not a positive plan, okay, to take down the U.S., Well, they is it? think it is. Do you think it is? Their ultimate idea is, yes, a positive idea. Okay, what is it? A one-world government. Oh, uh, right. Absolutely. Of course that's what they want. Right. And they're going to have it eventually. Absolutely. Now you can have a positive <clears throat> one. But the growing pains, right? the growing pains that we go through before we get there, it's going to be pretty horrendous. Not only are we going to have to put up with this crap with Nibiru, mm -hmm. which is a, a real thing, but this growing process that we're going through to end up eventually with a one world government is going to be painful as hell. And there's going to be a lot of blood on the streets before it's over with. Mm -hmm. Sadly enough, that's, that's, in my opinion, a fact. And that's being manipulated from a very high level. Okay, but we have white hats in the U.S. government that are actually trying to prevent this, are they not? We have some good men and good women who are well aware of what's taking place and what's transpiring, and they're t trying to modify, ameliorate, is that the right word? To make this growth pain as painless as possible. They're trying to not have as much blood as it might take. Uh, Growth from adolescence as a species and as a society is somewhat like the painful growth of a, an adolescent kid, 13 years old, who's trying to grow up. Do you remember when you went through that? It was sure. not fun time. Absolutely. So, okay, but let's get down to the nuts and bolts. The stock market is crashing. Mm -hmm. You need to invest in gold and silver the if you want to stay alive. The stock market was rotten to its core. Absolutely. But are you telling people to leave, to go to South America? No, What's your advice? I'm, I'm telling people that you're in for some difficult times. And I say this in my presentations. I jokingly look at them and say, you're all doomed. There's not a one of you that's going to be around a hundred years from now. You're doomed. So to hell with it. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> no, I tell people who are interested in listening for whatever it is I have to say, <clears throat> that you're in for some difficult times. It's going to happen. There is no way to avoid it. We cannot go on as we were mm -hmm. because some of our systems were rotten to the core and our banking system, the insurance programs, all of that, stock market, Wall Street, those guys were absolutely rotten. The housing industry? <clears throat> the housing industry. That... That was bound to fail. You talk about a bubble, <clears throat> it was bound to fail. It had to fail. Well, I'm glad it failed. Hope to hell that they learned something from it. No. Okay, but we're ta are we talking about <clears throat> martial law in the United States? I mean, what are we talking here? You're, you're talking about a time when you may have martial law. Uh, it's only one step away. You know that the authority has been given to the president to declare it. Right. The Congress gave that authority to the president years ago. 
I've even lost track of how long it's been. But anyhow, all the president has to do, whoever he may be, and that doesn't matter much anymore either, mm -hmm. because one nitwit is very much like the other. You have a national emergency, and it's declared. Right. Boom. Martial law. Mm -hmm. You declare a national emergency, which has not been declared yet, right. but we're right on the edge of it, right. and you're going to have martial law. Okay, and but we gone. don't have an election, right? <clears throat> well, it, the, it, you, you're thinking about an October surprise. I have no idea. I'm asking you. Well, I don't know about that. I, I'm not sure it'll happen in October. I, I suspect it may occur within the next year. Hmm. But uh, I don't know. I haven't had any dreams. My dreams have been pretty fascinating recently. But none of them have been terribly troubling. Hmm. And... Uh, I know this is all happening. It's going to take place. There's, it's inevitable. It's been orchestrated. The Illuminati do exist. They are in power. They've been in power for years. They've been demonstrating that power ever since 1913, when they created the, uh, what the hell is it, this banking system? The Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve, yeah, mm -hmm. which is a private corporation. <clears throat> we lost most of it in '47. I don't know whether you were aware of that, but that was a big year. National security became everything. It became the member of the triad. 47, we declared, uh, we made the National Security Agency. We uh, formed a pact with the Brits, the Australians, the Canadians, and New Zealands. The Yokusa Pact, which most people don't even know exists. <clears throat> the Akusa crowd, all of us, Britain, U.S., Canada, New Zealand, Australia, are all like this. Um, whoever's in the White House and who's ever at Buckingham Palace, it don't matter. All right. <clears throat> the power behind the scenes has been running this damn thing since 1947. And Ike saw it, scared the hell out of him. He met the Anunnaki, that scared the hell out of him. So they're pulling our strings now like they always have. Okay. So what's your solution? What would you t tell people? I mean, in facing the future, in trying to <clears throat> reinvent the future, certainly Marsha's working with people to, to become enlightened, to She's doing apply. a tremendous amount of work to help, to help people trans make this transition. Carrie, we're not just going through a transition. We're going through a transcendent transformation, literally. A transcendent transformation. We're going to come out of this thing when it's all over with. Totally different species. We're not going to be the same people we, we were in the past. Mm -hmm. And that's good. And it's going to hurt. And it's going to be painful. And I tell people, and I've said this repeatedly, don't get too uptight about it. You've been through hell before, you're going to through a bit of it again. But once it's over, once you've made that transition, we're going to have, hopefully, a new world, a new future, a new beginning. And I think that's the end of the great year that we're going through. We're, we're going through the, the end of a 26,000 year cycle. And we're, I, I tell you, 2012 don't matter. Mm -hmm. First of all, Christ was born seven years before, and this is a fact. And if you don't believe me, get uh, Sir Lawrence Gardner, who's probably one of the best historians we've got working today. Lawrence Gardner's got the facts. Jesus was born in 7 BC on the 1st of March. Now, if you, if you want to count from his birth, like we supposedly have been doing, Add seven years to 2008, you end up with 2015. That's pretty close to what... 20, oh, so 20, you're saying we're actually in the year 2015 <clears throat> now. No, you, you, we're in the year 2015 right now. Right. So yes. that means that Nibiru, when you say it's coming in 2020, is actually due in about five years. Probably. So we're looking at 2013 by our calendar. Well, no later than 2017. I'll throw 2017 out, okay. and you can take that to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> 
2017. Now, okay. that, you know, that'll give or take a year or two because the, the celestial mechanics, they, don't have, they haven't really worked at all yet. We've got, we've got computers you wouldn't believe, but they're still trying to feed in some of the data. So are you, is one of the remote viewers you're in touch with Ingo Swan? I haven't been in touch with Ingo for some time, but I, I, Carrie, I've been doing some remote viewing. Right. I've even had a couple of out-of-body experiences. Mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of meditating. When you go in, when you step into that world, there is no time. Mm -hmm. And you can talk to anybody, everywhere, all at once. And now, that sounds silly to anyone who doesn't understand what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. When you step into that realm of timelessness, and you remote view, and you step out of your body, and you go into altered states, and you meditate, you're in a timeless, infinite reality that people communicate. You be some... You'd be sh shocked and amazed at the wealth of information that's out there just to tap into. The old, the old ones used to talk about the Akashic Record. Mm -hmm. It's real. It's real. And it isn't just about the past, because, Carrie, there is no past. Mm -hmm. Nor is there a future. There's only an eternal now. And a physicist sitting here in this room would say balderdash because they wouldn't grasp for a minute what I'm trying to talk about. But old Ingo would. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've, I've been some of those places myself that you're talking about. I'm, I knew it, you see. <laughs> and so I have to say you're absolutely right. And, and it's uh, incredible pleasure for us to hear this from yourself, and um, I, you know, I would like to at this time just open the floor and say, is there anything that we haven't covered here that you would like to talk about? And then, of course, we would also like to invite Bill <coughs> to ask you some questions. We've danced around on a whole bunch of things for the last hour. I enjoy it. I I, I enjoy chatting with you two guys. Yeah. You're, you're pleasant people. Mm -hmm. As I say, I'm an old codger, and you, you, you plug me in and turn me loose. There's no telling where I may end up. I've been around uh, 79 years this trip. I've made a dozen or two previous trips, which amazingly I, I remember quite a bit about. When you start going into that timeless realm, <clears throat> you step into that infinite, which we're all part of. Uh, memories of other lives come flooding into you sometimes. Mm -hmm. Oh God, the things I've seen, the things I've done, the places I've been, this life are kind of shocking. The things I've done, the places I've been, and the lives I've lived before, are beyond belief. I, I'm not boasting. This is not a boast. Mm -hmm. But I'm an old soul. I've been around on this planet a long time. And I amazingly remember it. Some of the memories I would rather not remember because they're painful. Mm -hmm. Hell, I have memories of Sumer. I knew the Anunnaki back then. Worked with them. I was one of their products. I know them now. And I don't have any fear. In, in bringing this to a close, I, I would like to say to whoever is watching, get rid of the fear. You have nothing to fear. You are an immortal, timeless being who has an infinite future in a glorious universe. 
that's so filled with beauty and life that we on this little tiny planet couldn't begin to grasp. But I, I, I say to people, don't be afraid for God's sake. Gather around you those you love. Spread that love around. And go into tomorrow with courage. Because you've been through a hell of a lot worse before. So be hopeful, love one another, and have courage. And that's really all I have to say. Well, thank you, Bob Dean. It's, it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure. Thank you, Carrie Cassidy. I just enjoyed every minute of it. I'm 79 years old. What do you mean, hold that thought? You, you put yourself on the line and you, you actually embody the curiosity that was like rampant in all of us. And you did it at a time when, um, and in the military no less, and you broke rules and you, you kind of stuck it out and you're just, you're like, you're just, uh, I don't know, a one man disclosure project as far as I'm concerned. Well, thank you, Carrie. That's very kind of you to say that. But let me explain something. I was a normal human being for a big, big portion of my life. You know, I was a career military and uh, no-nonsense kind. I wore a crew cut. When I learned what I learned in 1963, 64, 65, it, it changed my life. It changed my way of thinking, and I became obsessed with what I had learned. And over the years, I've learned so much more. And as I may have mentioned to you earlier, I, I learned a little bit. I wanted more. You know, talk about an addiction. When you start learning some things about a subject that is so profound, the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And the more I wanted to know, the more I learned. And the more I learned, the more obsessed I became. And uh, you talk about losing a paradigm. My old paradigm literally crumbled around my knees. You know, the world that I thought I lived in, is I learned, was not the world that I lived in. And the reality that I looked around and thought I saw was not the reality that exists. Mm -hmm. That much of what we see is an illusion. It, it's, it's a result of our own illusions. We... <clears throat> We humans sometimes, rather, rather than face reality, we create a little, little world of our own. You know, we get up and go to work. We be at my next birthday, so I don't think they want to call me back to active duty. You know, I could have an accident, but I think why I'm getting away with what I'm getting away with, so to speak, where I'm releasing bits and pieces of this, this cover-up, is that there's somebody back there somewhere who wants me to do what I'm doing. Or I would not have been able to do this. But let me give you a tiny tidbit of bits and pieces that come from the Old Voice Network. There is an organization called the National Reconnaissance Office. You've probably heard of them. Absolutely. A very super secret group. I mean, a super secret group among super secret groups. God, we've got so damn many groups now. As I used to jokingly say, when poor old Ike left office, he tried to tell us about the uh, military-industrial complex. Well, it's a triad now. It's not just the military and industry. Mm -hmm. It's the national security agencies as well. Mm -hmm. So the, if he could see it today, he'd be shocked even more. Of course, I'm sure he's alive and well somewhere, so he's probably looking down chuckling. But we are a triad now. The super secret agencies with the military and the industry. It's all like this. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, <clears throat> there are people who I think want this out. We've, been, we've known for years that among the in crowd, whoever the hell they are, and no one really has ever been able to put our finger on it, we've been able to grab a couple of them from the old Magi group 
the wise men they called themselves, the Magi. You've heard them referred to as the Majestic Twelve. Well, they are a lot more than twelve now. <clears throat> Anyhow, I'm getting away with sharing bits and pieces and tidbits which intrigue me because I think somebody wants some of this out. But the story I was going to share with you is that perhaps have understood I have been a member of what we used to jokingly call the Old Boys Network. I've been a member of it for over 40 years. And when we created this group, it was made up of military types primarily. Uh, all ranks, all services. And we even had a couple of cosmonauts who were connected with this, mm -hmm. who were providing information. Well, over the years, the Old Boys have shared information with each other because we've had a variety of, of assignments and jobs in the military. We had a couple of admirals, we had a general, had two cosmonauts, we have innumerable colonels and command sergeant majors and people from all walks everywhere who provided information we used to share with each other. And some of us have been in very sensitive positions and had access to very highly classified material and we've been very open about sharing that with others, <clears throat> which kind of kept us going for a long, long time. There aren't a hell of a lot of us left. The last time I, re uh, originally there was a m roughly about uh, 150 members of this group. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and today uh, there's probably not more than a dozen left. Um, we, we lost a good one, uh, you know, Graham Bethune died here about a year ago. And Graham was a retired Navy commander who was a dear man, who had some very sensitive information he used to share with others. But as I point out, we shared among ourselves. And then a few of us who came out blatantly, purposely, and started sharing what we had learned with the public. Frankly, I never thought I was going to get away with it. I thought they were going to stamp on me and, you know, eliminate me or whatever. There was even rumors, for God's sake, that they were going to call me back to active duty and court-martial me. <laughs> you know, well, I'm going to be eight. Raise the kids, we buy a house, buy a car, take a vacation, go on about our lives, try to save money, put a little in the bank for the kids' college, and, and, and live a normal life. And then I learned that, that there's no such thing as a normal life that the world that exists is not at all what we think it is. And the more I learned, as I said, uh, my, my old paradigm crashed around my knees and uh, I'm sitting here in front of you uh, as, a, as a human wreck, you might say, you know, as to what I used to be. Because I lived in a world that was kind of cut and dried. Oh, you know, do this, do that, you pay your bills, you it's not that way at all. Well, let's cut to the chase here because you have come forward. Actually, you <clears throat> contacted us, I'm going to say, and said, you've got something new to say. You've got something new to tell the people. And I, I know you're going to be speaking at the Bay Area uh, mm -hmm. conference, and, and this is amazing. And let's let's find out what is it that that's new what is it you're willing to you you want me to divulge to you my great revelations which i'm planning to speak about at my at the conference right? absolutely and <laughs> and you know this this video will not be edited and out there before the conference so you don't have to worry that we're not gonna gonna ruin it for the for the viewers of the well conference. there's lots of little tidbits that are kind of interesting to me uh, I, ho I assume, I hope they'll be interesting to the people at San Jose. Uh, it's been my experience that the people who attend those conferences are pretty wide open, open-minded. Mm -hmm. As I jokingly used to say when I speak there, it's like preaching to the choir, you know, mm -hmm. because they're a different group of people. <clears throat> well, give me a, I'll give you a tiny tidbit, which I found interesting. As you...
some of our remote viewers have concluded that yes, it's going to happen this time. That we and it will be on the same side of the sun at the same time. And if the remote viewer, and they're getting their information from ETs, from sources within the US, U.S. government that tell me that yes, they are deeply concerned about it and they're worried sick about it and they don't know what to do about it. What, what could the government or anyone else tell you? What could they say to you? Would, would they tell you that, grab your hat, dig a hole, hang on? He says, oh, it seems to be a rather nice planet, and we know about it, and it, all we need to do is name it. And then bless his heart, you know, he, he'd never had a heart problem, but within a year he was dead with a heart attack. Incredible race of humans does have a future, and it is in the stars. Mm -hmm. And we are going out there to reclaim our rightful place. It's kind of amusing considering that the last time we met, I told you it was to be my last interview. And here I am again. And, you know, how can I explain that? We have gotten the most incredible response to your interview. I, I have to say, it's, it's actually been the most popular of all of our interviews. Well, and nice I think there's a reason for that. Well, thank you. Um, I, I think that in many ways,